Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Joel Blaney. Delighted to be here and hosting today's webinar, Understanding and Managing Cybersecurity Risk in School. Yes, we're a wholly owned subsidiary of Superloop, um, and we're Australia's leading provider of innovative cybersecurity solutions for schools. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome in our session today, Andrew Souza, the Director of HP OEM, Jason Acton, Atkins, Consulting Systems Engineer from Aruba, and one of our joint valued customers, Adam Ryan, Head of ICT at Ballarat Clarendon College, one of the leading schools in Australia. The agenda today will be talking through cyber threats facing schools, what is island hopping threats, advanced protection and multi-layered security, hardware risks and the role of secure platforms, delivery of seamless security process automation, real life experience uh, from Ballarat Clarendon College. And at the end, we'll have uh, some Q and A if there's time. So please uh, put any questions you have into the chat and we'll try to answer them uh, at the end of the session. So a bit of information on Superloop Cyberhound. I uh, appreciate most of you uh, know who we are by, the, by this stage, but uh, generally we're, we're um, I won't touch on all of those, but we're, you know, been in the industry for 20 years, we're education focus, uh, we're constantly innovating, uh, particularly in the K-12 environment in Australia. Uh, we integrate uh, with a lot of the uh, partners, uh, whether it's software or, or technology, infrastructure, etc. And I guess specifically, uh, one of our key partners is HPE and, and they're um, obviously Aruba is part of HPE there. Um, that partnership's helped us to deliver better innovative uh, solutions and services to our customers. Um, we've been part of the HPE OEM worldwide partner program for five years now. Uh, this has given us many benefits including world leading support through the point next 24 by 7 services for our customers appliances on site uh, which Andrew will discuss in more detail later in the session uh, in addition to our partnership with HP one of the most recent advances we made has been the integration with our IPS or intrusion prevention system with Aruba's ClearPass policy management platform and one of the people who'll be able to uh, discuss that later and it was an uh, integral part of the, the development of that integration was Jason Atkins from Aruba who joins us here today and he'll discuss more of uh, Aruba's zero trust security and how it helps us deliver the seamless security process automation to our customers. So as I guess uh, most people are fully aware um, adding to the anxiety around the developing COVID announcement from our Prime Minister Scott Morrison in June that there were malicious cyber attacks on a wide range of political and private sector organisations and industries carried out by sophisticated state-based cyber actors. I think most of us all remember the breaking news article and for some it highlighted their concern for their own environments in terms of what does this mean for us. Uh, as you can see down there, education was put forward uh, and centre as one of the uh, key industries at risk. Uh, for most Prime Minister's announcement about cyber threats would come as no surprise as malicious threats targeted as, as schools have been uh, on the rise for some time. Schools today have a host of a range of uh, sensitive data, whether it's financial addresses, medical, custodial, uh, which is all highly valuable data to cyber criminals. As of uh, February 2018, schools in Australia have been, uh, or have had legal obligations and responsibilities, as we all know, uh, to report any data breach under the data, uh, of, of data under the data privacy legislation. And the result, as a result, schools have an obligation to ensure that they have adequate security and infrastructure in place uh, to process, uh, to secure the data. Diving a little deeper, um, 
threats for schools or to schools these days um, can come in a, a range of different um, different ways, different vectors, whether it's ransomware, cryptoware, malware, phishing, um, attacks on IoT or other internal database breaches. Um, an example, I guess, it comes to mind for, from us uh, in September 2019 last year, uh, there was a ransomware attack on Flagstaff Unified School District in Arizona. And this was so disruptive to schools to close, uh, close them down for two days and affected 11,000 students. Uh, they shut down the internal, in, sorry, the internet connections to all of the, eight, the 16 schools in the district. And as you can imagine, uh, it was incredibly disruptive for many families and education of the students. Uh, more recent example of company was uh, Garmin. We've probably all seen that as well. Garmin's Connect uh, service suffered a significant outage for several days. Um, moving on to the next slide. The most recent attack, I guess, or vector that we've seen ourselves is island hopping. What is island hopping? So essentially cyber criminals gain access to schools otherwise secure network through uh, you know, a less secure partner um, or supplier um, and then through that uh, are able to I guess gain access to the school by, by proxy or uh, other way given that that's a trusted relationship. And so it's critical to ensure that not only are you uh, protecting um, attack, I guess, or vector that we've seen, but it's critical to watch and, and maintain um, visibility of, of your partners. Uh, and a recent example of that was Nopetya. Uh, for those that don't know, they're a giant um, large shipping conglomerate and um, obviously they had significant infrastructure in place to protect their network, but um, there was a sort of a scenario where their uh, accounting consultancy and, and firm um, whose software was, was compromised. And then through that, um, this consultant, um, the software running on the local network of this organization um, allowed them access to, to the critical, um, critical information and databases and this was then locked. Uh, lockdown and, and cause massive issues internationally. So a key threat for, for school environments is web threats. Um, when we talk about web threats, a big example of that is phishing attacks. And so it's a scenario where you're not just um, not just software being installed on on um, you know a, a virus or malware. It's a link out to to external environments. Um, and I guess we, you know we've all heard the story where someone received an email that clicked a link, uh, thinking they were going to pay a bill or provide uh, some updated credit card information, or a student may have clicked the link, uh, and then it takes you off to a malicious website. So web filtering to us at, at CyberHound uh, is so much more important and it's so much more than just blocking inappropriate websites. Uh, it is now an essential layer of, of defense. Um, CyberHound's own advanced web security solution has AI powered uh, detection of phishing URLs, including zero day threats. Um, provides instant protection against emerging threats to real time continuous updates. Uh, unmatched coverage of, of up to 99.9% .9 of active web domains and full path URLs and IP addresses constantly being updated. Overall, again, CyberHound, uh, we, we see security as a multi-layered approach needs to be taken. Uh, no one of those components you see there are, are critical uh, or, or any more critical than the other. Um, Obviously, having a firewall is critical. Deep packet inspection to do application control, uh, IPS or intrusion prevention system is, is critical as well. Um, and web threat prevention is just one of those. Uh, but digging deeper then, 
the, the actual hardware platform that we run on is, is just as critical as well. Um, and obviously that runs on, on the HP OEM, leveraging our relationship there. Um, it's been un, underpinned for, for a number of, you know, for five years now, and, and it's something we can re rely on. And it's an area that I guess CyberHound ourselves don't have to focus on um, because we're able to, to leverage that capability through HPE. And with that said, I'll, I'll hand over to Andrew from HPE now to talk a bit more on that. Thank you, Joel. And um, also I'd like to thank uh, my co-presenters, my colleague Jason, and also Adam uh, for joining us from, uh, from Ballarat. Um, a couple of us are actually presenting from Melbourne. So um, apart from being indoors bound these days, it's probably the first time we've worn jackets uh, in a number of months. So it's a dress rehearsal for when we go back to work as well. <laughs> anyway, look, uh, to everyone, thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, join the, um, the presentation. Um, what I'll talk about is a couple of things uh, from HP's perspective. I run the OEM program, um, and but I'm very integral to the uh, enterprise group at um, HPE, so I can talk about a number of things. So I'll talk about, first of all, the world as we see it today. Um, what are these phenomena that are driving change? Um, our CEO um, has this saying, I was just watching, listening to one of his keynotes before this presentation, and he said, the, the future belongs to the fast. There are so many... Uh, driving forces um, happening at the moment that uh, organizations like ours have to uh, you know, change very quickly and uh, um, make for uh, relevant products. So customers such as yourself um, can drive safe um, and valuable enterprises or environments. So what I'll talk about is the world as we see it today. I'll talk a little bit about the other HP strategy. What is it that we're attempting to do? And uh, then at the end, I'll talk about the OEM program and what relevance that has not only for uh, Superloop um, and Cyberhound, but also for you guys as customers. Um, so Joel, if you'd go to the next uh, slide, please. One of the um, real um, stalwarts of our range at HP is our servers, a uh, legend of servers. Over the years, we've invested a lot of money, billions and billions of dollars into R&D um, to make this uh, you know, world leading range um, characterized by their fast, their secure, money. Um, we've also made a number of acquisitions over the course of the last few years, having bought so a key threat for such as Silicon Graphics and uh, Cray Research. Um, and in addition to our R&D, what enables, uh, this enables us to do is to look at the, the values across all of those efforts. And um, when we talk about web standard servers, so what our customers get is really good um, servers. In line with this seminar, one of the um, important factors of our service, one of the things that we really coined these days is the fact that um, we make the most secure industry standard servers in the world. Um, with the threat of um, cyber breaches these days, um, we took an approach where we wanted to guarantee um, the safety of our servers. So with that, we actually put the security, a lot of the security provisions in the actual firmware. <clears throat> and what happens is that um, based on hardware, we want to ensure that the uh, computer is booting from a known state. So what there is, there is a um, thing called a, um, an ILO um, flash, and then there is the other uh, silicon. And when the computer boots up, it actually checks on the fact that you know, the, uh, the firmware is a known state, and only then will it permit the computer to boot up. If there's any intrusion, it recognizes the intrusion. Um, it'll prevent the computer from booting up and it'll actually then revert back to that core state, um, that known state. And this can be all traced right back to the factories to ensure that uh, we know exactly what's in the computer and it'll only operate um, if that standard um, can be defined. In addition to that, as a result of all the R&D that we're doing, um, the new generation of Gen 10 uh, servers um, continue to lead the world in uh, compute power, um, very fast memory, there's a high concentration of storage, but also more importantly, as I'll talk later on, with this big explosion of a data that's actually happening and with you know, more emphasis on um, exchange across uh, networks such as 5G networks, we're putting a lot of emphasis on all of our devices having intelligence and security built into them. That's, a, that's an absolute must these days. Um, so as a result of the, uh, the software that we have in the computers, um, these things are always optimizing and uh, running at a very efficient state. Uh, Joel, if you'd go to the next uh, slide. 
So, you know, the world is, uh, we all see it. <clears throat> First of all, what we're starting to see is everything is becoming uh, interconnected. Um, and with that, there's a lot of data that's being generated. Um, uh, with regard to everything being interconnected uh, at a consumer level, people are wearing things. Um, in the factories, there's sensors on the machines. Um, inside cars, um, there's sensors to actually optimize the uh, performance of the vehicle to report on how it's running. Um, so what IDC is seeing that by the year 2025, there'll be something like 40 billion devices out there that, is ga that are gathering data. And with that, there will be something like 80 zettabytes of data being generated. To bring it down to more, um, Provost is saying that is each person on average um, will be generating instant protection against emerging gigabytes a day. <clears throat> every car will be generating 4,000 gigabytes of data every day. Um, so that's you know a huge amount of data. And then the, the challenge arises, of course, is you know what do you do with all that data? Um, you know, companies that are going to lead are those that can actually get the maximum value out of their data. Today, something like only 6% um, of data is actually um, being used for any sort of value. Um, so what we'll see more and more is there's a lot more emphasis on um, software and intelligence to extract more value out of the data so you would actually know what's happening with your uh, organization, what's happening with your uh, customers, and what's happening with your uh, devices. Um, Technologies such as 5G and also with 6G um, on the roadmap um, make connections a, a lot easier. Um, our transmission speeds are a lot higher. The networks are bandwidth and ability to carry a lot, a lot higher. So the world's ability to become truly interconnected um, is, um, you know, really quite in place. You know, with all that data, there's also a, um, a need to um, put your compute as close as possible as you can to the edge. Um, so you'll hear this uh, terminology of edge compute come up, you know, far more frequently. What doesn't make sense is that as we have all these devices out in factories and cars and on people, that everything gets shifted back critical uh, or, or any more critical there. Um, that's just not sustainable. So what's happening is that compute is being placed as close as possible to the edge. So what you see as a result of that um, is uh, compute devices in cars, um, compute on the factory floor. Um, so the first level of processing um, happens there. And then there are indeed exchanges, you know, with the other uh, data center and the cloud. But what we need to ensure then is that uh, that's done in a very secure way, particularly um, if there's any proprietary information or there's any personal uh, data there. The other thing that, uh, you know, we're seeing is that um, no question about it, people are migrating some of their services towards the cloud. In fact, I think in the early days, there was probably an over-rotation where um, a lot of the, uh, the applications and data was pushed to cloud. What we're seeing now is um, people are a lot more conscious of placing workloads and data where it's best suited. So the position that we take as a company um, is to say, look, the cloud is not a destination, but it's, it's a journey that you're on. Um, so our strategy revolves around a hybrid cloud model where you put your applications and you put your data where it best suits your company or your organization and its users. Um, so with all of that, um, let's talk a little bit about what we're doing about all of that as a company. Joel, if you go to the next slide. So with um, HPE, um, our strategy moving forward revolves around three core planks. What we see is that um, things will be edge centric. Um, there'll be most, a lot of the compute that will occur will be at the edge. Um, our environment will become a lot more data driven. There's a need to get more value out of data and to also secure that data. So as a result of that, what you'll see from HPE is that across every device, there is intelligence and uh, security built in. Um, really key. So you probably may have uh, been following the news, but a lot of the acquisitions and development efforts that we're now undertaking um, involve uh, software. Um, that serves to uh, not only secure um, your data, but also um, helps uh, optimize the value getting out of the data and also optimize the operations of our computers, our storage devices, and also our networking products as well. And then finally, um, we see a cloud enabled world. In actual fact, a hybrid um, cloud world where it becomes a matter of choice. Our strategy is to become open and to, uh, to offer choice. 
and uh, therefore um, if it best suits you we'll continue to deploy work with partners such as Superloop and Cyberhound to deploy hardware on site but increasingly give you the choice of uh, deploying your uh, data and applications and workloads um, out into public or even private cloud. So really that's the uh, the strategy from HPE um, where we see things as being edge centric, data driven and cloud enabled. Now the tricky thing of course is actually how do you actually transform your state into that. Uh, one of the things that we know is that the technology part is relatively easy. Um, there's a lot of great stuff out there. Um, we have a lot of sophistication around our products and our technology, so the technology is there. Um, the hardest part is actually the people and the processes um, to actually put the processes in change and to get the people um, to uh, to move with these changes. You know, often we're in a position where um, a consulting organisation may go in and uh, make recommendations, develop a state of the future, and uh, what holds things back is um, the people and the processes um, holding back that transformation. So with that, um, we continue to grow and invest in our point next services business where we can actually work alongside partners such as Superloop and um, schools such as Ballarat College um, to help with these transformations or also just to make people available to do certain projects. Finally, um, the economics, um, you know, a world has moved on where, um, you know, in years gone, we're taking the time to uh, join the um, or, an, uh, or a solution like a security solution. It was a matter of saying, well, you know, this will cost you ten thousand dollars, and we'll take a check for ten thousand dollars from you, and then we'll deploy. Those days are well and truly gone. Um, people need more flexibility, um, and people also want to pay for what they actually use. So, one of the important drivers that we have at our company is Hewlett Packard Enterprise Financial Services, where we can take the capital-intensive nature of uh, acquiring technology and make it more of an operational budget. So you're looking at a charge per month as opposed to one, one big check. And with that also, um, we're offering consumption models where what we comprehend at certain, what, what the market requires is a pay for usage model where instead of actually buying everything um, up front and you sometimes buy more than what you use, um, we're saying, well, look, you know, we'll actually work um, with your workload. So in some parts of the year, it might be something like uh, December and January, the workload decreases, you pay less for your compute. Whereas approaching June um, in the commercial world, there is a spike in compute requirement and uh, we'll bring on the extra capacity that, uh, that you need. Um, ultimately, from uh, the other thing to, to mention from uh, HPE is that um, our quest, um, as defined by our CEO Antonio Neri, is that within the next two years, by 2022, we'll offer everything as a service. Um, so for the, those of you that say, look, we're a school and that's what we focus on, um, we don't want to get into this business of compute. You'll have the option, if you want, um, of buying technology um, as a service as opposed to buying boxes in a capital intensive way. Um, now that's an option, you know, for some people they'll continue to deploy on site because it suits their organization, it suits their skill sets. Um, so what our job is to offer things as, a, as an option, but that big, another big trend of HPE is that we'll make available all of our products, hardware and software as a service to our customers. One other thing, a uh, very important initiative um, from HP that I'll talk about just very quickly um, is our environmental position. Um, what happens as customers go on these journeys of transformation, there is an often need to uh, swap out all of the old equipment. In days gone by, um, that was a real environmental issue. What do you do with the old plastics, the LEDs, the screens and all that stuff? Um, it has a very negative impact on, on the world. Um, so what we have around the world is a number of um, sites um, that actually um, deal um, with old equipment. And uh, what we're able to do is um, in these factories, we can refurbish 89% of equipment that came, comes back. And the way that it comes back to us is through things like uh, uh, new financial options where you want to, may want to buy a new computer system for your school and say, what do I do with the old stuff? HP Financial Services will, in a lot of cases, buy that back from you um, so you can then acquire the new technology. So we'll take the old stuff, bring it into one of our factories, refurbish it, um, and in 90, 89% of cases, we can redeploy it um, somewhere else around the world. It could even be a third world country. Um, 
of the remaining 11%, 97% of that um, we can break down and actually recycle and reuse. So what we've only got is 0.3% um, that can be classified as rubbish that we need to dispose of. And that's something that we're working on. I think that's going to be quite an important uh, factor that in addition to all this technology and leading edge stuff and helping you move forward and get better value out of uh, your compute and your data, um, we're also taking a very solid approach on our dealing with, uh, with wastage. Uh, next slide, please, Joel. So um, HPOEM, um, I, initially I wouldn't expect uh, any of our audience to uh, even worry or care about what OEM means. Um, I, I run the OEM program across uh, the Australian New Zealand region and uh, the whole intent of the program um, is to stand up partner solutions. Uh, so in the case of CyberHound, they have a very good cybersecurity solution for schools. Um, we've worked a lot with them. Um, they're presented at our forums, not only in Australia, but also in Singapore and also in the United States. Um, it's really critical for us that um, partners like Superloop have a very robust foundation on which to stand up their software. So ultimately, um, what this results in is um, a more reliable running appliance um, that translates into lower risk for our end users and also greater customer satisfaction. So the overall experience is a very positive one for all concerned. I won't go into all the details of the program, um, but what it involves is we offer extended warranties to uh, CyberHound. We offer really long platform life cycles, so nothing changes for five years. And what that means is that there's no need for the software guys to worry about changes in processes or memories or other things that could result in a glitch of the software. We offer a lot of stability. The other things that we offer is things like um, resource centers and uh, priority support lines. So the only reason why I mentioned the OEM program, apart from holding down a job for myself, um, is that we work with companies like um, uh, Joel's uh, to ensure that the applications that they make um, can run on really robust and very well supported um, foundations. So you guys, um, the schools, get a greater experience out of the whole thing. So with that, I want to thank you very much once again, um, and I'll hand back to uh, to Joel. Thanks very much, Andrew. Some really, really fascinating insights there from from yourself and and HP. And again, I'd just like to yeah reiterate some of the things you were saying around the fact that you know our partnership with HP OEM has meant that we don't have to worry about the, the hardware platform that we're running on. Uh, it's it's stable. It's consistent. Um, it's one, you know, less thing that I guess our, our software developers who who are focused on, um, you know, the the program of Cyberhound, the um, security threats, and, and um, making sure that that application is, um, you know, constantly developed and, and improved, uh, without having to concern ourselves with not only the the actual hardware but the support. Um, you know, I'd argue that, that no other um, firewall product on the market has has the the capability and support um, and you know the robust nature of of the HPE uh, platform that, that we run on so yeah th thanks again Andrew um, and one of our value joint customers Adam Ryan from Ballarat Clarendon College has been a customer of HPE and used their systems in the school for over 15 years uh, Adam thanks very much for joining us today uh, if you wouldn't mind could you tell us a bit more about your experience with HP systems and the benefits they offer to your school's environment? Yeah, thank you, Joel, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. I might get a school bell go off during my little <laughs> aspect here just to well, remind everyone what it is like being at school. <laughs> um, as you've mentioned, look, we've been a customer of HPE for 15 years, so, you know, and including more recently the innovative market leading technology from Aruba, and we're thankful for that partnership. Um, HPE is certainly regarded as one of our key strategic partners. Um, in my time here, obviously over 15 years now, we've used you know HPE servers, Aruba switch, and ILO um, three pass storage. Um, you know we are we are effectively a HPE house, and we hold that strongly due to you know even we spoke quickly before about you know support. For instance, there's the bell. Um, <laughs> 
you know, obviously, and we've tested that before, the HPE same day support, like that's that's incredibly important to us as a as a customer or client, you know, especially when you're using a product like Cyberham, we know that it's sitting on HPE hardware and we know that HPE hardware is well supported, not, you know, not having to wait days and weeks for repairs and things like that. So, um, obviously, over our long-standing relationship, you know, we've been witnessed to a lot of evolution from HP Aruba, you know, an, an increase in the integration with other systems and platforms. And that's obviously what we're talking about today. So, you know, typically systems didn't integrate or speak well to each other. Um, and, you know, much of what Andrew said, you know, we're now building on relationships that we have, you know, with HPE, um, Cyberhound to, you know, make our systems speak to each other and use, you know, leverage the smarts within those platforms and put them to good use rather than just sitting there like the, the technology is there so you know that's actually being realized now and you know thankfully we're seeing results of that as well um you know and that i think it shows that it's clear that you know hp and, and aruba or hp aruba however you want to say continues to listen to their customers and we're you know we're one of those customers and have been a long time one so um, obviously, Cyberhound in that piece, this, you know, the Cyberhound service has given us many cybersecurity benefits, you know, which now includes that. As a result of all the R&D that we're doing. Pass, um, you know, and cybersecurity obviously is embedded into our school's risk register at board level. Um, you know, so being able to respond to that particular risk in a systematic, controlled and logical way you know, through using tools like Aruba ClearPass and the IPS Cyberhound, you know, through Cyberhound and that integration piece, you know, it's allowed our risk profile in this space to become far more insightful. Um, you know, the integration with ClearPass has enabled us with the ability to actually see when a threat has been flagged or mitigated in a live state and react accordingly. Um, you know, and that includes quarantining a computer on our network and not allowing it to reconnect Generally, that happens even before we actually get a trigger. So, happy to discuss that in detail. But yeah, you know, we're thankful of that relationship. Yeah, thanks very much, Adam. And uh, yeah, it's really good to hear you. You've enjoyed the your experience with HP Solutions. Um, in addition, obviously, HP servers and the secure platform with your Cyberhound. Um, you mentioned there that you've also implemented Aruba's ClearPass. To have more emphasis on. Um, I mentioned earlier that that was one of the recent advances in uh, what, we, what we've made in our integration with our IPS system um, and then obviously integrating with Aruba's ClearPass policy management platform and the key person who worked on that with us was was Jason, uh, Aruba's consulting systems engineer. Mm -hmm. So Jason, if you wouldn't mind, tell us a little bit more about Aruba's zero trust security and, and how it delivers value to schools. Yeah, for sure. So um, that was great, Adam. It's great to hear from customers that are actually using the technology and it's all working. It's, you know, that's, that's what makes this job worthwhile. Um, if I take it back a little bit, uh, back about probably three months, we actually released um, a new thing which we call the Edge Services Platform. Now, this is not, um, so as a result of the uh, component, which actually uses a lot of our different uh, components, I should say, our wireless, our switching, SD-WAN, um, clear pass and so forth from that zero trust side of things. Um, we actually encapsulate that into this ESP platform that, that we've developed. Now, what that is, is it's a few different things. So AI ops, as you can see on the left-hand side there, uh, this is the ability for our wireless and our switching components to actually learn from itself and actually provide information and feedback back uh, to the sysadmin about things which are occurring on the network. So artificial intelligence that's coming into everything, I don't think it's going to replace our jobs, but uh, you know, there's a lot of a lot of things there that we can actually do. So I'll give you an example. Um, this is one that we've been using uh, for demonstrations, um, just to highlight the how this AI insights work. So one example is we just built a new uh, VLAN up to a access point. So we put it into VLAN 100, we join it up, and then all of a sudden, maybe we don't have DHCP configured in that VLAN. Now that's something that you know, even as a a system engineer that you know, has been working on networks for a long time now, you may not work that out for a little while, but what will happen in the background is our AI ops system 
will realize as people start to connect, if they don't get an IP address, uh, it can start to flag it and then look up the configurations and make recommendations back to us. It can also raise TAC cases as well in the back end. So it'll actually gather all the logs and, and do a lot of the, the legwork that you need to do before you can get to that point where you can start to, to investigate issues. Now, like I said, this all runs on top of our uh, infrastructure at the moment. So as a Aruba, we do wired and wireless. Uh, we, we do security around that as well. We do things like um, SD-WAN or SD-Branch uh, on top of that as well. So this is our unified infrastructure, all comes together and we have control over that from a, from a security perspective as well. And on the right-hand side, you'll notice Zero Trust. So this is a component of, of this ESP platform and it brings a number of different technologies together here. So ClearPass that we, we mentioned um, previously, so ClearPass is our, our radius access control system, uh, also does a lot of profiling on the network as well, and then applies enforcement um, you know, to, the, to the edge user. So let's get you to move on to the next slide, Joel. Uh, so when we, when we started building this, so security is not new to Aruba, right? When we first started about 12 years ago, we actually built security into our wireless platform. So it was fundamentally there, it provided layer seven firewalling capabilities. So the ability for the access point, and in this case now the switches, to be able to filter on applications like, you know, is this user allowed to get to Facebook? This is a security camera which is running on our network. Should the security camera be able to go to Dropbox or maybe send emails, for example? So we can actually set application policies around that. So that's been, like I said, built into our products for the last 12 years, and we've just built on that technology. When we overlay that with ClearPass, ClearPass is what's looking at the devices connecting to the network and the users, and then setting a policy for those users. So putting them into that um, security role. If, I, if you look at what we've got on the screen here, so this is all based on the NIST framework. So I don't know if anyone out there is using um, the NIST cyber framework, but this is what we kind of, we hung our hat on when we were looking around at, at, at some compliance uh, documentation and framework to actually apply to, to the Aruba stack. So if you look on the left-hand side, identify, then protect, detect and respond. So identifies about profiling and fingerprinting every device that connects to the network, well, I say every device because you, you don't want any any devices which may be shadow IT which are just plugged in. For example, an access point plugged in, maybe it's at the back of the library into an Ethernet port and then the students are sharing that out. So you want to make sure that we can profile and then uh, make sure that device can't connect to the network. It's where the protection comes in. So this is typically where our Aruba ClearPass linking in with, with the wired and wireless infrastructure, not necessarily Aruba. We have a lot of integration with our own products, but we, we can work with, with pretty much any technology out there that can talk radius, right? Um, and then the two on the left-hand side, so the detect and the response. Um, so let me just, um, I guess, um, look a little bit deeper into that. So I mentioned before that we have layer seven firewalls built into our, our um, wireless technology. So we can see things like Facebook, for example. However, we can't see things like a, a potential malware attack, uh, attack or cryptoware or something like that. So that's where we rely on our integration partners. Okay, so we're not monitoring the traffic per se for all those little security um, glitches that could get into the network and then potentially attempt to get out of the network. So we have a number of integration partners um, and the way that this technology works today is typically through APIs. So most products these days will have an API. Um, so then we can get responses coming back from those security platforms. So for example, the response that comes back from the CyberHound will be a message back to ClearPass, uh, which will then allow us to quarantine those devices. So that's how we kind of tie it all together. You want to hit the next slide, Joel? Thank you, sir. So I'll give you an example of how this looks. So on the left-hand side here, you can see all the devices connecting in. Doesn't matter if they're IoT, if they're, they're human-based devices, uh, printers, maybe a, an AirPlay device for, you know, for projecting onto a TV. Every single device gets authenticated into the network. Now this comes through the infrastructure, so wide and wireless is typically how we connect these devices. Um, pretty much any of these devices uh, we will work with, like I said, as long as they talk radius, we can typically authenticate against them. You notice ClearPass in the middle there. So ClearPass is the brains behind um, our zero trust methodology. It's gonna take information or what we call contextual information from a number of different sources. Now you can see on top, we're pulling information in from 
from an MDM system around devices which are a part of the network. And below, we're also pulling information in from, uh, you know, from our uh, antivirus players and you know, potentially Microsoft Intune as well to find devices which are a part of the network. Now, these come through extensions. Extensions are a little bit unique. What they are, they're like Docker containers running on top of ClearPass. So what we can do is we can actually provision software through these containers without having to upgrade ClearPass, okay? It makes it really, really simple to do it. We just did one for a customer in Asia. It took us three days to, to get a, um, a beta version of it running. We then got them to deploy it as an extension, and now they're doing the authentications for what they need for, for that um, um, integration with that third-party product. Now, on the right-hand side there, you can see what we call Exchange or the IEE. Now, IEE is what we call the Ingress Event Engine. This is where the CyberHound talks back to ClearPass. So the idea being that um, when the CyberHound picks up a discrepancy, so let's say it's malware, it then fires an event message back to ClearPass. Now, once ClearPass receives this message, we can do a number of things with it. First thing we're typically gonna do is, we're gonna find the device that, um, that's affected, we'll mark it as quarantined, and then we'll bounce it off the network. So when it connects back in, we'll now place it into that quarantined role. At the same time, we could now be sending information out to other third-party systems, for example, Splunk, just for, for um, syslog information. We could also send an email out to the sysadmin to, to say that this device on this with this user has now been quarantined, or we can do that through raising a ticket with something like ServiceNow. Again, API calls out to those third-party systems. So when we kind of tie it all together, this is what it looks like from a, from a zero trust perspective um, with Aruba. Okay, I'll, I'll pass it back to you, Joel. Thanks very much, Jason. Um, and again, yeah, we, we've really enjoyed working with you and the team to make this integration possible. And uh, um, so you'll hear this in a minute. Yeah, that's uh, great. Our technology um, integration is providing critical visibility and, and policy automation in, in school environments. Uh, this diagram shows exactly how our integration works. So at a very high level, our IPS technology is updated in real time from our Threat Intelligence Center. Um, it immediately detects uh, threats at the perimeter as well as on any device connected to the network, including BYD devices or even IoT sensors. Our integration with Aruba's network access controls and triggers an immediate policy action. In most cases, this seamlessly removes any compromised device. Uh, Adam has had a recent example of uh, how Ballarat Clarendon College has been using this clear uh, ClearPass Zero Trust uh, protection to great effect in the school and, and why it is now considered a, a vital element of the college's cybersecurity posture. Adam, you shared that uh, you, your college had a recent event um, with, with our IPS and Aruba ClearPass integration um, and how it's been valuable. Would, would you mind talking a bit more about this? Yeah, absolutely, Joel. I think just before I jump into that example, I think it's important here to note you know, as a customer, we were up and running with the integration between CyberHound and Aruba ClearPass within minutes. Um, so much so I performed the installation myself and can speak firsthand on how easy it was to provision. You know, obviously everyone that would be watching this webinar now has the skills required to achieve this. It's not, not difficult. Um, the instruction guide that, you know, you get from Aruba, from the Aruba team was step by step. You know, it was that simple. You know, which is obviously how we all like it. So, yeah. You know, Thanks, Adam. Very, um, very good point to, to make there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And look, as you mentioned, you know, we're we're constantly being targeted. We're seeing we continue to see that trend. You know, and obviously, as a school, we need to take all reasonable steps to defend against the threat. So, this is one of those seamless integrations, I guess, that takes no time to implement and should be on the top of everyone's list to achieve. So, you know, when we put it in, we saw results immediately that we didn't even know existed on our network through other means you know, and that's particularly around you know the number of student laptops connected to our network i think you know schools are unique where you've got kids that go home and do different things and they bring that you know nasty back into the school so it's certainly not complicated um like i say once we were up and running you know there was several threats that we 
detected it's the school bell again it could have been devastating obviously you know devastating if it weren't for the power of this very well integrated technology um and the recent example that you've mentioned joel was you know we had a student that brought their laptop into the school without realizing it had been compromised with crypto wear and um, we've heard stories about other schools where they've almost effectively been shut down so um, you know, they obviously contracted that at home, brought it onto our network. It wasn't detected by the endpoint AV at the time. Obviously, it could have been a zero day. Who knows? Um, you know, that damage could have been irreversible, costly and highly disruptive to us as an organisation. Um, you know, CyberHound detected that malware immediately on our network and then triggers a Ruby clear pass to immediately remove the student's device from the network, as Jason said, you know, literally puts it in quarantine. You know, an alert is obviously sent out to our team noting the threat in real time as well. Um, and again, you know, once the machine's quarantined, the student or staff member, whoever it is, is blocked until our support team is able to inspect the machine. You know, obviously we'd hate to think what would have happened in that instance as a result of a ransomware attack or having a malicious actor operating on our network. You spoke about island hopping before, you know, given the sensitivity of data we hold, there's a lot, there's a lot of play there. Um, you know, knowing that we've got an additional barrier of defense now in, in our arsenal helps me sleep at night. You know, knowing, you know, that we, you know, what we didn't know previously, thanks, you know, obviously now to the integration between these two products. So obviously I'm happy to discuss that a little bit further during the Q&A at the end or outside of the webinar. Thanks very much, Adam. That's, um, yeah, really, really insightful. And um, yeah, I think we all will model where you'll put your applications and tropic stories around what, what can happen with, with crypto and, um, you know, to, to, um, to the benefit of often it is is um, a scenario where the, the endpoint AV doesn't necessarily pick it up, but thankfully uh, that's a, a vector that that always has to dial dial home, which means that the, the cyberhound gets to get to to sort of see that see that traffic and um, act on it accordingly. So that's really good. Thanks again. Uh, moving on, so I guess you know we're talking a lot about um, Island hopping and other threats within within I guess the the tent of, of your your school's security posture. So, um, so I guess open up a little bit on on Superlip Cyberhound ourselves. Um, a point I like to make is the fact that as as Cyberhound is part of a telco and a, a telco that owns critical in, international and domestic infrastructure. We, we are held accountable to an extremely high standard, as you can imagine. Um, as a critical infrastructure provider, we're bound by many other or many legislative uh, and compliance requirements, one of those being the telecommunications sector security reforms. Um, it's a good read if you've got uh, a few days to, <laughs> to look that up, but it's, it is really interesting to, to think about. And when you are sort of looking and, and picking vendors and partners that are going to be um, supplying critical infrastructure to to your school. Um, how do they manage their own environment? Um, you know, on, on the topic of island hopping, uh, how secure is either that a managed service provider, or is that firewall vendor, or is your your network provider? Um, and so, you know, Superloop, we we have ISO twenty seven thousand and one. Uh, all of our infrastructure around public keys and other are uh, are critically protected um, and by our um, chief, chief information security officer and, and CIO. Uh, so good to point out there. Um, a statement from um, from our obviously partner. Um, we've been a OEM partner for for five years, as I've mentioned previously. Um, we're very grateful to stand on the shoulders of, of HP with that hardware platform leveraging things like uh, the silicon root of trust and, and other capabilities around their support 24 by 7 on site uh, is not something uh, you know ourselves or, or you know even some of the the larger more corporate focused um, firewall providers could could do really at the level that HP does so again we're extremely grateful there um, 
we've got some great resources available. Um, obviously, the the integration guide um, that Adam mentioned earlier, step by step, um, verified by Aruba um, on, on how to set up this capability. Some more sort of high level information around our advanced web security, our integration. Um, really good case study as well from from Adam at um, Ballarat Clarendon College. So um, some good reads there. I, I believe we'll have the links in in the mail out um, with the video recording. Um, and so I guess I'd like to throw to our Q and A now. We've got a few few minutes. Um, I can see we've got uh, I think one question here. Don, um, would you recommend configuring security rules on different infrastructure or just the firewall? For example, configure security rules on the switches, wireless infrastructure. May have uh, been following the news, but a lot of all, it's uh, it's definitely not one I'll, I'll uh, weigh into. But uh, perhaps Jason, if if you you wouldn't mind take giving your take on that. Well, let me do it from the vendor side of things. So we always <laughs> see that you, you want to have that segmented approach. Um, so you want it to be layered. So um, what I would suggest is, you know, ClearPass is going to authenticate, work out what the device is, who the user is, and then we can set a policy. Now, first of all, we'll push that back to the the wireless controller or, or the switch, for example. You know, switches are pretty dumb at the end of the day. We can put some access lists on them, but we can also do a, a segment, what we call dynamic segmentation and tunnel traffic from switch ports up and through through our wireless um, gateways as well but then like we can't see everything right so then we need to send information to the firewall and expect something to come back from the firewall as well so adam i'm sure you you've done this in your network i'll pass it over to you for a customer side of things and look obviously as we've spoken about clear pass is that center i think you know that in that slide that we had everything comes into it so clearly that for us in our organisation, that's where we spend a fair bit of our time around that enforcement um, policy. You know, it, it sees so much activity. Obviously, at the same time, you know, we try and take as many steps as storage devices and also use as we go on that journey as well to you know achieving, I, I guess, you know, blocking something like crypto. Where also thinking at the same time not to overcomplicate the system to a point where if one leg in that chain fails, the whole thing will fall apart and you'll spend quite a bit of time trying to, you know, which brings me back to obviously that clear pass and cyberhand. Like I say, when that particular integration occurred, um, it was all very self-explanatory on, on alert levels, you know, alert one, alert two, alert three, alert four, and what that means behind it. You know, obviously if it hits an alert four, that's where it jumps into a block or quarantine. So for us, you know, we obviously rely heavily on, you know, that detection piece in the background working. So, yeah, I'd, I'd prefer not to overcomplicate, but do as much as you feel reasonable as well. Fantastic. Thanks very much, guys. Uh, I don't think we've got any other questions, so um, I might... Uh, wrap up and and say you know a, a big thank you to to hp and aruba for for joining uh in partnership with with us to to deliver this um and also a huge thank you to adam it's been really great hearing hearing your insights and um from your your own and, and from ballarat clarendon college's experiences there um look by all means feel free to reach out to to myself uh andrew souza uh had to give his apologies. He had to drop off a little bit earlier, and and of course Jason from Aruba there. Um, right, Joe. Any further questions? Um, but otherwise, thanks very much for attending, and um, we look forward to working and speaking with you all uh, sometime soon. Cool. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.